Assalamu alaikum everyone. I'm Atas al a third year medical student. And uh, today I will be explaining to you the uh, ventricular uh, pressure volume loops. Uh, Amr has already went through the uh, basics of the pressure volume loop. So hopefully it will be easy for me to uh, uh, explain the changes to the pressure, uh, pressure volume loop um, in terms of uh, preload and afterload and contractility changes. Uh, also, today we'll be discussing the starting law of uh, the heart and why that uh, right and left heart uh, have like similar outputs. Uh, we'll also uh, be covering the regulation of the contractility in terms of uh, positive and negative inotropic agents, and also the regulation of the heart by the autonomic nervous system. And finally, we'll go over uh, some definitions like the cardiac output, stroke volume, ejection fraction. Uh, and their uh, calculation. Okay, so before we we, we dive into the lecture, uh, let me uh, see if Amr did a great job explaining this. Uh, okay, so as you know, this is a BV loop and uh, the BV loop um, represents one cardiac cycle or uh, one heartbeat. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, and uh, the left ventricle, uh, left ventricle uh, volume uh, is, Present, uh, is represented in the uh, x axis and the left pressure is in the y axis so uh i need i uh, i want you to tell me what is a in terms of uh, uh valve filling or op uh, valve Metro opening valve. or closing Metro Metro valve valve open. Open. yeah, yeah. Open. Uh, what about c closing of the mitral valve. valve closing yeah and d i want to valve open it's valve valve uh, sorry? And the F is the, the closer, valve right. closing. Yeah. Okay, so in terms of volume, what do you think is C? Uh, and and diastolic volume. And diastolic volume. And what is A? And systolic, and systolic volume. And systolic. And systolic. And the difference between end diastolic volume and end systolic volume is what? The stroke, stroke volume. volume. Stroke volume. Right. Okay. So, uh, 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 first, before we go into the lecture, uh, I want to uh, I want you to understand this in, uh, important concept. So, the cardiac output is the stroke volume multiplied by the heart rate. And the stroke volume, uh, as you see, is measured in milliliter per beat, uh, meaning that stroke volume is the amount of blood that, that is ejected from the heart uh, in every beat. And heart rate is the number of beats uh, in every minute. And uh, the, the beats cancel out, so the cardiac output is measured in liter per minute or milliliter per minute. And... Uh, uh, and uh, it's defined as the amount of blood that is ejected from the heart uh, in, uh, per minute, okay? Uh, and the stroke volume is affected by three factors, the preload, the afterload, and the contractility. Uh, the heart rate is affected by two factors, with, which is the uh, sympathetic nervous system and the uh, parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, I have a slide uh, that will explain this, but at the moment, you need uh, what you need to understand is that the sympathetic, sympathetic nervous system increases the heart rate, the parasympathetic ne uh, nervous system decreases the heart rate. Uh, and the uh, stroke volume is measured by the end diastolic volume minus the uh, end systolic volume, as we saw in the previous slide. End diastolic volume uh, is the vo uh, volume uh, that is present in the uh, ventricles just before, uh, like, Right after uh, after diastole ends and just before uh, you eject the blood, and systolic volume is the uh, blood that is present in the ventricles after you're done with systole. Okay, after you con you contract the blood out of the heart. Okay. Now the way to understand these three factors: the preload, the afterload, and contractility. I need you to think of the heart as a balloon. Okay, uh, think of the preload as the uh, as the heart getting stretched uh, uh, by by blood. So the more you put blood into the heart, the more it gets stretched, and this is the preload. Okay, 
uh, the contractility is the more you get, you uh, stretch the, uh, the the heart or the balloon, the more it is the the more the force, the more the the contraction or the more the 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 air is removed out of the balloon. Okay, after load is uh, the way I want you to think about it is the knot that ties the uh, the balloon, and it's the resistance. So the heart has to push uh, at a much greater uh, force to overcome the afterload. So uh, the heart needs to, okay, wait. So the afterload is the resistance or the amount of force that the heart needs to overcome to push the blood out of the, uh, of the heart, okay? Now in, in, uh, in the next slides, I will be discussing the uh, BV loop changes. Uh, I'll be discussing uh, changes that happens when we have increased preload uh, increased afterload and uh, increased contractility. Uh, in reality, these are interrelated, meaning when one parameter is changed, the others get changed. For example, when you increase the preload, uh, you increase the contractility, as we will see in the Frank Sterling uh, law. Uh, however, in the next uh, few slides, uh, what I will be doing is uh, um, an artificial scenario where we will be uh, only covering one parameter while keeping the other parameters fixed, okay? Okay, now the inc uh, increase in preload. What, where do you think will the, uh, the uh, graph shift to? Is it going to shift to the right, to the left, or is, or is it going to, sh uh, to shift uh, upwards? You're allowed to unmute yourself or uh, type in the chat. Okay, I'm, I'm going to, to give you a hint. Uh, the way I like to remember it is like, um, P is pointing towards the right side. The P is pointing towards the right side. So uh, the, the, the curve, uh, the graph itself will be shifting towards the right side. Now, I don't want you to, to uh, just memorize the graphs for the period, the uh, afterload and the contractility. I want you to understand it. And how do you understand it? So the more, uh, we said, you know, the, the stroke volume is affected by three factors. One of the factors is the preload. The more you increase the preload, the more the stroke volume. And the stroke volume is represented by the uh, difference between the end diastolic volume and the uh, end systolic volume. So since we have more stroke volume, meaning th this difference will be increased. So you will have more, uh, so th the difference here will be more increased, okay? And that's why the, the, the graph shifts to the right side, okay? This is the, the doctor's slides, it's the same uh, thing. Uh, the dashed line is the, uh, the, uh, the graph without increasing the preload. And uh, the straight line is after increasing the payload, okay? Uh, in this slide, what he wants you to understand is that uh, when you increase the preload, uh, you're causing more stretch on the, um, uh, on, the on the cardiac muscle. As I said, uh, think of, a, of the preload as the stretch. The more you put blood into the heart, uh, the more it gets stretched. Uh, so stretching the cardiac muscle, as you stretch the card, the more you stretch the cardiac muscle, the more the number of cross bridges. Uh, and these cross bridges, they uh, they happen uh, between the what the actin and the my uh, the myosin filaments. So when there is more a uh, number of uh, cross bridges, there will be more uh, uh, contraction or more force to contract the blood. Okay. So this is the Frank Starling uh, law, which states that when you increase the preload. You're causing more stretching. More stretching means more uh, cross bridges, or you're engaging more uh, more cross uh, bridges, and then uh, as a result, you're increasing the strength of uh, contraction. And uh, this is what uh, it says in the slide: an increase in the preload stretches the muscles uh, uh, before they contract. Uh, and this is the starting slow of the heart. You start with the venous return. So when you increase the venous return you will uh, uh, definitely increase the uh, left atrial filling. Left atrial filling means, uh, no way. So you, you increase the uh, venous uh, return. 
So this is the right side of the heart. You increase the venous return, so more uh, more uh, blood is coming to the uh, right side. From the right side, it goes to the lungs, and from there, it, it comes back to the left atrium. So more uh, venous return means more uh, left atrial filling. This results in increase in left ventricular filling, uh, which is the end diastolic volume or the preload. And as I said, the more you uh, fill the heart, the more the uh, the uh, muscles uh, muscle cell gets stretched. And this is what uh, it's stated by the increased sarcomere length in myocytes. And uh, not only the the uh, the uh, the filling increases the sarcomere length in myocytes, but it also does uh, three other things. We said one of the things is, is, the, is the number of cross bridges. So one thing is the number of cross bridges, it increases. The other thing is the myof myofilament calcium sensitivity. So the, 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 the heart muscles, they become more sensitive to calcium. Uh, and also the, uh, the filaments, they, co they come closer, making it, making it easier for the cross bridge attachment, okay? And uh, the net effect of these three mechanisms is that the force of contraction is increased. And this is what's stated by the Starling's law meaning that the left ventricle uh, uh, shock volume will increase and the cardiac output will increase. So the more uh, preload you're putting, uh, the, more uh, the more stretching on the heart, uh, and the more stretch, the more you're, uh, uh, the more the, the, um, the heart is, the more the heart reacts by increasing the force of contraction, and the more the shock volume, the more the cardiac output. Now the next is the afterload. As I said, the afterload is the resistance or the, uh, the, the amount of force that the heart needs to overcome to push the blood out of the, of the heart, okay? Uh, the way I like to remember uh, the afterload is by this. The A and the afterload is tall and skinny. What do you think that does that mean? Like where will the curve uh, shift to? Up and to the left. Yeah, exactly. Oh, wait. Explain. Uh, okay, Noor, uh, we'll explain it uh, in the checkpoint. Okay, I have a checkpoint uh, for, for questions. Uh, uh, yeah, you said up and to the right. Uh, it's up, okay. And uh, the reason for this, because when you increase the afterload, um, the, the, the heart has hard time to push the blood out of any, the, the heart has the heart has hard time to push the blood out of it. Tamam? When you have, when you're not pushing the blood outside, so you, your stock volume is decreased. And that's what's indicated by the B. See, we said that the stock volume is the end diastolic volume uh, minus the uh, end systolic volume. But now since the stock volume is decreased, the, the difference is now decreased. So this is the, uh, the normal, and this is after incre uh, increasing the afterload. So the, the, uh, the stock volume is decreased. You see, this is the stock volume normally, and this is after increasing the afterload, it's, it's decreased. Also, because the stock volume is decreased, the end systolic volume is increased. So uh, there will be more uh, blood in the uh, heart after contraction because the heart is finding a hard time to push the blood outside, okay? So the end systolic volume, so instead of being at this point, it's now here, okay? So it's increased. Uh, this is for the afterload, okay? And this is the doctor's slide. Uh, um, increase afterload, uh, this is in the case of systemic hypertension. Uh, you have an increased afterload, and uh, this is why the the uh, normal curve, the dashed line, uh, is shifted to the uh, straight line. So it's it's now uh, decreased stroke volume and increased increased aortic pressure. This is because of the increased uh, aortic pressure, and there is a uh, uh, decreased end systematic uh, end syst uh, end uh, systolic volume. Sorry. So ventricle pressure has to rise higher than normal because, uh, before the aortic semilunar valve opens, plus stroke volume is decreased. So the ventricle pressure has to be higher than the uh, aortic pressure for the valves to open, okay? And this is why the stroke volume is decreased because 
the pressure in the aorta is high and and the, uh, the ventricle pressure cannot uh, reach to that uh, pressure and that's why it, the stroke volume is decreased uh the increase in contractility um, um so let's think about it this way you have more force to uh, to to eject the blood when you have more force to eject the blood you're you're increasing the what the stroke volume so the stroke volume will increase okay but uh, and the ejection fraction ejection fraction uh, uh, is an index of the contractility i'll explain it later but for now understand that the, when you have more contractility uh, there will be there will be more blood ejected from the blood, uh, from the heart so the stroke volume will be increased okay this is indicated by this so see the the difference is now increased and the end diastolic uh, end systolic volume is decreased because uh, you're ejecting most of the blood and so uh, what's remaining in the heart is little Okay, and this is what it's meant by end systolic volume. So end systolic volume is decreased now, and the stroke volume is increased. Uh, this is the doctor's slide. Uh, it's the same thing. Uh, he doesn't want you to know about the ASPVR line. He has a slide uh, that was explaining this, but he was like, you know, you don't need to remember it, and you will not be examined about it. If, uh, I just did not. Uh, uh, put it in this slides. Um, uh, so this is the contractility. This is the, the dashed line is the normal and the increasing contractility is the straight line. See the, the curve shifts to the left. Okay, now uh, this is the first checkpoint. Uh, you want me to uh, go over this again or do you have questions? Okay, no is saying uh, okay. no is saying uh, please re uh, re explain the um, the preload and the afterload. Okay, uh, preload is the um, uh, what you what you can think about the preload is the it's the same as the end uh, diastolic volume. It's like the the volume that that is present in the heart after the diastole uh, finished. So when when uh, the ventricles finish relaxing, uh, the, the the mitral valve and the aortic the the mitral valve and the aortic valve are closed. So th this volume that is present in the in the uh, ventricles before ejecting it outside, this is the preload or the um, the end diastolic volume. Okay, uh, the the afterload um, uh, the afterload is the uh, the amount of force that the blood, uh, that the heart needs to overcome. So the heart needs to, uh, the, uh, the, the heart needs to overcome this force so that it can bump the, uh, the uh, blood outside, okay? This is for the afterload. And the afterload can be increased in many diseases. Uh, one of this, as I mentioned before, is the systematic hypertension. Uh, other is like uh, the aortic stenosis. So uh, the aortic stenosis, the the, uh, the valves, the aortic valves are stenosed, so they're stiff, and they cannot, you cannot, the, the heart cannot push blood outside the uh, the uh, outside through the uh, the valve itself. Uh, uh, okay, I guess I I answered the same question. Any other questions? Okay. Next is the inotropes. Inotropes is simply any agent or any uh, drug that can change the uh, contractility or the force of the heart uh, muscular contraction. And inotropes can be positive or negative. If it increases, uh, if the if this agent or drug increases the contractility, it's considered a positive inotropic agent. If it decreases the contractility, it's a negative inotropic agent. So uh, the positive ionotropic agents, how do they work? Uh, they work by increasing the sarcoplasmic uh, calcium concentration. Sarcoplasmic uh, uh, reticulum is a, an organelle. It's an intracellular organelle that is a storage for calcium, okay? Uh, and, uh, um, and these positive ionotropic agents, they work 
by increasing the uh, the, the uh, calcium concentration in the sarcoplasmic and uh, the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And uh, there's two way uh, there's two agents that uh, uh, that are considered positive inotropic. Uh, one is the adrenergic agonist, such as the norepinephrine and epinephrine, and they do this by stimulating P1 adrenergic receptors. I have a slide explaining this. And the cardiac uh, glycosides, such as digitalis and digoxin, both of these uh, they have the the uh, similar function. Um, uh, these are drugs uh, that that are given to people who are uh, uh, who have uh, heart failure. Uh, and uh, what 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 uh, what do these drugs do? Is that they inhibit the uh, calcium potassium bomb, and this leads to an increase in intracellular uh, calcium. I'll explain this in a while. Um, uh, also, uh, the joxin has the same uh, effect as digitalis, but it has something extra, which is that it decreases the uh, speed of conduction of the action potential through the AV node. This means that it decreases the heart rate, okay? So the, the, uh, the digitalis and the joxin, their first effect is on the contractility. So they're positive inotropic agents. They increase the contractility. How do they increase that? By increasing the intracellular calcium. Um, the, uh, the joxin, however, has uh, something else to do, which is uh, through the AV node. It decreases the speed of conduction, so it affects also the heart rate. Uh, so the digitalis and the joxin affects uh, 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 the digitalis only affects the uh, the uh, the um, contractility. The joxin affects the contractility and the heart rate. Okay. Uh, and adrenergic agonists are uh, uh, they affect both the the heart rate and the contractility, as we will see later. Okay, so how do, uh, we'll go through each one of them now. Uh, how do the adrenergic agonists uh, uh, work? This, uh, the adrenergic agonists are the norepinephrine and epinephrine. Uh, they bind to the beta uh, adrenergic receptor. And there are two types of uh, receptors, the uh, beta one and beta two. The, the way I like to remember this is uh, beta one uh, is in the heart because we have one heart. Uh, beta two is in the lungs because we have two lungs. Okay, um, the the norepinephrine and epinephrine they bind to the beta adrenergic beta one adrenergic receptor, um, uh, uh, and beta adren adrenergic receptor is a G protein coupled receptor, uh, uh, specifically the GS G uh, uh, G protein stimulatory, um, and when they bind to it, it activates the GS uh, the GS protein. Uh, which which results in the activation of the adenine uh, adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase uh, is an enzyme that converts ATP to cyclic AMP. Now, when uh, uh, now because there is an ac uh, accumulation of cy cyclic AMP, uh, it results in activation of uh, um, uh, what is it called the uh, sorry uh, protein kinase A protein kinase A yeah. Uh, the moment you hear protein, uh, the moment you hear kinase, it means it's going to phosphorylate. So it's going to phosphorylate proteins, whether it's going to uh, make them act uh, active or uh, uh, deactivate them. So cyclic AMB is going to activate protein kinase A. Protein kinase A is going to phosphorylate uh, four different things. First, it's going to phosphorylate um, um, uh, L-type uh, calcium channels allowing for more calcium to get into the cell. Uh, it will also uh, phosphorylate the ryanidine uh, channel uh, so that more calcium is uh, bumped, uh, bumped out of the sar uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, it's, all, it's also going to, um, this is for contraction, okay? Uh, it's also going to uh, phosphorylate the phospholampan. Uh, this is associated with terca, uh, sarcoplasmic endoreticulum. Uh, calcium ATPase, and uh, what it functions is that it uh, 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 uptakes the calcium that is in the cell and brings it into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So when it gets phosphorylated, uh, no, normally uh, phospholamine uh, inhibits this uh, enzyme, uh, this uh, uh, channel. But when it's when it's phosphorylated, uh, this inhibition is reduced. So um, uh, more calcium is, uh, gets into the cell. And it also phosphorylates uh, troponin I. So again, uh, adrenergic agonist 
uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine, they bind to beta-1 receptors. And through a couple of reactions, the GS, it activates the adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase uh, converts ATB to cyclic AMB. Cyclic AMB uh, activates protein kinase A. And protein kinase A, uh, since it, it's called kinase, it, uh, it phosphorylates uh, four things. Uh, first is the L-type calcium channel, allows more calcium to get in, uh, which is good for contraction. Um, it also uh, phosphorylates the ryanidine channel, making it uh, making the calcium inside the sarcoplasm uh, uh, lasmic reticulum uh, get out of the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum to the inside of the cell. Uh, also, it uh, phosphorylates the phospholamban, uh, which reduces the inhibitory action of the phospholamban on the cerca, so that now more calcium gets into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And finally, it uh, 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 phosphorylates the troponin I. Uh, this is the slide uh, that the doctor uh, uh, put. Uh, so it's the same thing. Uh, Norepinephrine binds to beta-1 receptors in the, uh, in the surface membrane. It activates the GTB binding protein, the GS, uh, G-stimulatory. Uh, then the alpha subunit, because the, the beta-adrenergic receptor, it has multiple subunits, a alpha, beta, and gamma. And uh, upon binding of the uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine, uh, the alpha subunit dissociates from the, uh, from the other two um, subunits, the beta and gamma. So when the, they, when uh, the alpha dissociates, it goes and activates the adeni uh, adenylcyclase. And uh, when adenylcyclase is activated, it converts the ATB to cyclic AMB. This step, uh, ATB to cyclic AMB. Uh, cyclic AMB uh, is going uh, uh, to act on the regulatory sub, uh, the regulatory unit of the uh, protein kinase A. So protein kinase A has a, a, a regulatory and catalytic uh, uh, region. So uh, cyclic AMB is going to act on the regulatory uh, uh, region, which will result in the dissociation of the catalytic region from the uh, uh, regulatory region. So the catalytic region of the protein kinase A will go and uh, do the four uh, uh, things that we talked about, uh, which is phosphorylating the L-type calcium channel so that more calcium is, uh, gets in, increased influx, uh, the uh, ryanidine, uh, uh, um, uh, ryanidine channel, uh, um, so there would be uh, more permeability to calcium, so more calcium gets out of the, uh, of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, it will also uh, phosphorylate the phospholamban, uh, as I said, uh, and uh, you may think, you know, this is uh, not good for contraction, but uh, when you think about it, yani phospholamban, uh, uh, as it this diagram explains better. Uh, Phospholamban, uh, normally, it what it does is it inhibits the cerca, so that uh, um, um, uh, it inhibits. This, uh, no, normally, uh, what? Wait, I'm sorry. Uh, so wait, normally, uh, phospholamban it inhibits the uh, the cerca, so that uh, the calcium is. Uh, is present in the outside of the uh, it's and it's present in the inside of the cell. Okay, so when it's phosphorylated, this inhibitory action on the cerca is reduced, so more calcium gets in. And you may think that calcium uh, gets into the cercoplasmic reticulum is not good for contraction. However, when it gets in uh, uh, into the uh, into the cercoplasmic reticulum, so that more accumulates in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and more gets released in the next uh, uh, cycle or the next speed, okay? Uh, finally, the uh, troponin I, uh, troponin I, um, uh, phosphorylation of troponin I will result in uh, um, the, the myofilaments being less sensitive to calcium, uh, meaning that, uh, yes, it will decrease the force of contraction, but however, the other three mechanisms, the L-type, the ryanidine, and the phospholamban, uh, they will cause, uh, they will compensate for this loss, okay? So th these three these three mechanisms will, will cause more contraction. Uh, the, the fourth troponin I phosphorylation will cause relaxation, okay? Uh, okay, this is a uh, this is a graph uh, that shows the ventricular uh, and diastolic volume against the stroke volume. Uh, here you can see the this is the normal or the control. Uh, it shows the intrinsic uh, 
uh, as you increase the ventricular and diastolic volume or the preload, uh, you're getting more stroke volume as we uh, we, have, we have discussed before. Uh, uh, however, with sympathetic simulation or when norepinephrine is present, uh, you'll get more contractility. Uh, so for the same ventricular and diastolic volume, which is, uh, let's say, point A, you will get more stock volume, okay? Uh, this is the effect of the uh, sympathetic stimulation. So uh, uh, as, as said here, uh, the increase in preload will increase the, uh, the, uh, the stock volume, and the effects of this uh, sympathetic stimulation will, will, will further increase the, uh, the preload and the stock volume, okay? Uh, now we have talked about one part of the uh, of the uh, positive inotropic agents, which is the uh, beta adrenergic, uh, uh, the adrenergic agonist. The other part is the uh, cardiac glycoside. We said that the, there are two agents, uh, uh, the digoxin and digitalis. Okay, uh, so this is a muscle cell, and uh, we have the uh, the sodium potassium ATPase. Normally, you have sodium potassium ATPase and the uh, sodium calcium exchanger, and the uh, sodium potassium exchanger is dependent on the uh, uh, sodium calcium ATPase. Uh, we said before that digitalis or digoxin, uh, they work by inhibiting the sodium potassium ATPase. So how, this, how does this increase the calcium? Okay, so we have digitalis, tamam. It, in, it blocks or inhibits the uh, potassium, uh, uh, sodium potassium ATPase. Now, normally, Normally, uh, the potassium, uh, the, this this uh, uh, this channel uh, uh, bumps uh, the the uh, potassium from the outside to the inside, and sodium from the inside to the outside. Okay, so when digital when digitalis is, is administered, uh, it blocks the uh, sodium potassium uh, ATPase. So um, the 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 potassium is accum uh, the potassium accum uh, accumulates outside. And the sodium accumulates inside. Okay, so so now we have more sodium, so the sodium will increase, and because this uh, uh, channel is dependent on this channel, uh, uh, this channel uh, it usually uh, brings uh, sodium in, and this uh, and uh, it brings calcium outside. Okay, so because there is increase in uh, so uh, sodium here inside the cell, it will not uh, it will not bring the sodium in, and so it will not uh, uh, um, uh, expel the uh, uh, the calcium inside the cell. Okay, again, so uh, digitalis it will bl block the uh, sodium potassium ATPase. So more potassium will be outside, more uh, more uh, more uh, sodium will be inside because there is more sodium inside. The uh, calcium will not be uh, pushed outside, so there will be an increase in potassium, uh, I'm sorry, so, uh, calcium. And uh, as a result, there will be uh, more troponin C calcium binding and uh, eventually leading to more inotropy or more contractility. Uh, is this clear or should I repeat it? The, the iron spot uh, is a bit uh, confusing. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. This is the the doctor slide. Uh, uh, th uh, what this di uh, diagram uh, shows is that he did an experiment uh, and uh, he administered uh, strophanitidine. It's a uh, it's a glycoside, and. Uh, uh, he examined the 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 um, the uh, ventricle cell, and uh, he, uh, this is the contractility, and this is the sodium, the intracellular sodium level. Okay, so uh, th this is this was before administering the uh, uh, the glycoside. So after administering the, the the glycoside, what he noticed what he noticed was uh, that the intracellular sodium increased, and this uh, this uh, was. Also, um, um, this was also supported by the increase in the con uh, contraction. So what he's trying to say here is that the glycoside they work on increasing uh, the the uh, the cal uh, the uh, put I'm sorry, 
So what 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 he wanted to say here is that the glycoside, uh, their job is to block the uh, sodium uh, potassium ATPase, and this will lead to the increase in the uh, the um, sodium, uh, and as a result, there will be an increase in uh, uh, in uh, calcium, and thus more contraction. Okay, that's what he wants to uh, to to uh, what he wants you to understand here. Uh, so the main uh, efflux pathway for uh, put, uh, for uh, calcium is via the sodium calcium exchange, as we saw here. So this is the only way it can be uh, uh, expelled outside the cell. Uh, and digitalis it blocks the the uh, the the uh, uh, sodium potassium ATPase, uh, and leading to intracellular uh, more of the intracellular uh, sodium. And thus, more intracellular uh, calcium, more uh, troponin C calcium binding, and more entropy. Okay, uh, and this is what uh, he's uh, he's trying to say here. And uh, this reduces the transmembrane concentration gradient for uh, sodium, which is the driving force for the ex uh, ex uh, traction uh, extrusion of uh, calcium from the cell. Calcium efflux is, is reduced, and calcium within the cell increases, producing an increase uh, contracted. It's the same thing. Okay. Uh, negative inotrop uh, inotropic agents, we said that there's positive and, and negative. Uh, the positive, they increase the uh, contractility. Negative, they, they decrease the contractility. Uh, the negative, how do they work? They do the opposite. They decrease the uh, uh, sarcoplasmic uh, calcium concentration. And how do they do that? They do uh, that by two, uh, two things. Uh, so two agents uh, are considered the negative inotropic agents. Uh, one is the calcium channel uh, blockers. So if you're blocking the uh, calcium check, uh, channels, uh, there won't be uh, calcium entering the cell, okay? Uh, and also the beta blocker, uh, as we saw before, beta blocker will cause uh, eventually uh, activation of protein kinase A, which will result in more calcium in the cell. But because you're blocking the beta, uh, beta uh, because, you're uh, because you're blocking the beta receptors, so you're uh, doing the opposite, okay? You're not you're not uh, uh, you're not uh, making more of um, uh, cyclic KMB. So uh, but, uh, protein kinase A is not activated. Uh, 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 so if, if protein kinase A is not activated, the, the there would there won't be a, a phosphorylation of the L-type, the uh, calcium channels, the ryanidine, and the uh, phospholamine. Uh, so here's another uh, uh, checkpoint. Uh, uh, I'll uh, uh, I'll just summarize all of this in in one. Uh, uh, I'll explain this in one in this graph, uh, and then you can ask questions if you have. Okay. So uh, we said you know the the positive uh, positive inotropic agent. There are two: the beta uh, adrenergic agonist, which is norepinephrine or epinephrine. They bind to beta receptors. Uh, causing uh, the, uh, activation of the adenine, uh, adenine cyclase. Adenine cyclase converts ATB to cyclic AMB. Cyclic AMB uh, um, activates uh, protein kinase A. Uh, when protein kinase A is uh, activated, uh, it phosphorylates um, for proteins uh, or four channels, the L-type uh, calcium channel, the ryanidine channel, the uh, troponin, I, uh, troponin I and the phospholampin. Okay, uh, this is for the uh, uh, beta agonist. The joxin, we said, you no, know, uh, it inhibits the so, uh, sodium potassium ATPase. So more, uh, uh, so uh, um, uh, uh, sodium uh, will not be able to move outside the cell. So it will accumulate inside the cell. More sodium inside the, uh, the cell means that. Uh, potassium will not be able to go outside the cell, meaning more, uh, meaning more uh, 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 intracellular calcium, and this uh, will result in more contraction. Okay, this is for the uh, for the uh, 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 the inotrop the positive inotropic agent. For the negative, we said there's two: the beta blocker. It does the opposite effect of the beta agonist. It inhibits the uh, beta one receptor. Uh, uh, and you know the rest. You no, know, it it inhibits the beta one receptor. Uh, it will not ati activate adenine cyclase. No uh, cyclic AMB will uh, will be produced. So there will not be activation of uh, protein kinase A and no phosphorylation of the uh, the four proteins that I talked about. Uh, 
uh, the calcium channel blockers, uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, they will block uh, the calcium uh, channel. So no calcium will be uh, entering to the cell. This will uh, result in a uh, decrease of uh, intracellular calcium and less contraction. Uh, don't worry about the, the other uh, uh, things. What I need, uh, What is needed for you to know is uh, these four things. So there will be less of gradient to drive. Uh, yeah, because uh, sodium is uh, is uh, more outside. Okay, let me go back to the diagram. Okay, now because uh, 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 normally the, the uh, as I said this this uh, exchanger it will it'll, uh, it will uh, uh, push sodium from outside to the inside. Now because the sodium inside is high, there will be less uh, concentration gradient. So because there's less concentration gradient, the, uh, uh, the, the, the sodium outside will not be pushed inside. And this will uh, uh, affect also the calcium because it's, a, it's an exchanger, it's a two-way uh, exchanger. Uh, so because the uh, so sodium inside the cell is increased, this will affect the, the exchanger so calcium will not be uh, able to go outside the cell. And this would result in increase in uh, intracellular calcium. Uh, is that uh, understood, uh, Jenna? Yes, yes, clear. Thank you. OK. Uh, any other questions, guys? <clears throat> OK. Uh, next is the autonomic regulation of the heart. Uh, um, uh, the moment you hear autonomic, you should think of two things, uh, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic uh, nervous system. OK. Uh, uh, now we're done with contractility and other parameters. We're talking about the heart. Uh, OK. So what happens when there is uh, increased sympathetic uh, uh, activity? So when there's increased sympathetic activity, as we saw in the, in the previous slide, uh, sympathetic activity will result in increase in uh, cyclic AMB. And the, uh, the increase in cyclic AMB will cause uh, activation to the, uh, will increase the activation of the funny channels uh, or the funny current. Uh, so that, so when, when, when the, uh, the funny current increases, there is more, um, uh, there is larger conductance, so more, uh, no, before I explain the sympathetic, you know, you know, uh, do you know the uh, phases of the uh, the uh, the um, what is it called? The action potential of the uh, SA node. So this is uh, phase four. This is phase zero, and this is phase uh, three. Okay, phase four is driven by calcium. Okay. 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 Uh, so, uh, uh, increasing the sympathetic uh, nervous system, uh, it will have two effects. First, on the uh, phase four, uh, uh, in phase four, it will, uh, as I said, it will increase the cyclic A and B, uh, meaning it will increase activation of the uh, funny current. Uh, this will result in the potential, the action potential, uh, uh, the, the 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 phase four being conducted uh, at a rapid rate or faster rate. So if you if you can compare the uh, the normal uh, normal graph with the with the sympathetic simulation graph, you would see you know the the, the it takes more time to reach the th uh, threshold. However, in the sympathetic, it uh, it reaches to the threshold at a, a, le a lesser time. Okay, this is one effect of the sympathetic nervous system. Also, the sympathetic nervous system, uh, uh, as you said, you know it increases uh, cyclic AMP. The cyclic AMP has effects also on the uh, IKRS, uh, IKR, and IK, uh, IKS uh, uh, channels, and these are responsible for the repolarization or phase three. Okay, uh, and because uh, the uh, 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 sympathetic, what what the sympathetic nervous system does is that when it acts on these receptors uh, or these channels. Uh, it results in uh, the the uh, the um, the uh, the curve being 
uh, uh, moved to to a lesser uh, uh, a lesser um, um, what is it called it, maximum uh, depolarization uh, potential. Okay, so instead of it being here at negative sixty, it's reduced now. So if you notice uh, the in, in the normal, it's at negative sixty. However, when uh, uh, upon sympathetic stimulation, it's decreased to close to the threshold. Okay, so it has two effects: the sympathetic one on the uh, uh, funny ch uh, funny channels or the funny current, uh, um, and the other effect is on the repolarization or the IKR or IKS. And uh, the net effect of both of these uh, mechanisms is increased heart rate. Uh, is that clear? Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, what he wants you to uh, to know here is that uh, A is normal. Okay. And B is uh, sympathetic. After sympathetic uh, stimulation, you can see that there's uh, more uh, pressure, and uh, and uh, the the um, the uh, yeah uh, here yeah in A it, it's normal, and uh, uh, in sympathetic uh, stimulation the action pot potential are generated uh, more rapidly. So uh, because it generated more rapidly, th there will be more contraction. And that's why the the left ventricular pressure is increased, and the the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, action potential finishes at a lesser time than the normal. You can see that the normal ends here, and the uh, the the uh, the uh, the uh, after sympathetic simulation it ends at uh, at a lesser uh, time. Okay, so you can fit more action potentials in le in uh, in the same time, as you can see here. The previous. So here you can see that there are four action potentials. However, uh, when you uh, uh, when there is sympathetic simulation, you can see that there is more action potentials. Uh, the opposite is for the parasympathetic uh, nervous system. Uh, nervous system, yeah. Uh, 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 parasympathetic stimulation it will lead to release of uh, acetylcholine. Uh, acetylcholine will do the opposite. Uh, instead of increasing the activity or the, uh, uh, activating uh, uh, the funny current, uh, it will decrease the funny current. So the 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 uh, the the upstroke or the first phase phase uh, four will take much more time. As you can see, uh, the normal uh, takes this much. But when uh, during uh, parasympathetic stimulation, it takes more time. Uh, this is for uh, the first part of the uh, parasympathetic. Uh, what it also does is that it increases the uh, perme permeability of the calcium channels. So more calcium gets into the cell. And because uh, it gets out of the cell, I'm sorry. Uh, and because more cal uh, because uh, why does calcium goes out of the cell? Because we have more of calcium inside the cell. And because the the channels are now per, uh, permeable to uh, to uh, potassium, uh, the 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 uh, the uh, ions move from the high concentration area to the low concentration area. So uh, because now after parasympathetic stimulation, the 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 uh, pot the uh, potassium channels are per, uh, permeable, so that calcium uh, I'm sorry not calcium potassium. Uh, will move from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell, making the inside of the cell negative. So it will uh, uh, um, uh, cross the uh, uh, the maximum uh, uh, depolarization uh, potential, and it will hyperpolarize. So this is the net effect of the parasympathetic uh, uh, nervous system. So two things: it will uh, it will do one second. Uh, okay, so the the two effects of the parasympathetic is that uh, it will decrease the funny current, as I said, making the the upstroke 
uh, uh, the upstroke. So the upstroke will take much more time uh, to reach the threshold, as you can see here. And the, the other thing that it, uh, it will uh, do is that it will, uh, 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 it will result in hyperpolarization uh, so that the maximum uh, deeper, uh, 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 deeper diastolic potential will be more negative, okay? So it will go after, uh, uh, after the negative, uh, negative 60, as you can see here. So this will result in decreased uh, heart rate. Is that clear? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought the camera is off. Uh, um, okay. Uh, okay. So parasympathetic, it will it will do the opposite uh, effects of the uh, sympathetic. Uh, we said we said in that uh, that the sympathetic will increase the uh, uh, funny current. Uh, in, the, in the parasympathetic, it will do the opposite. It will decrease the funny current. Uh, funny current is the upstroke or the first uh, phase, uh, which is the phase uh, four. So when you decrease the funny current, there will be less of calcium entering this, uh, this uh, uh, entering the cell, and this will result in uh, uh, much more. Yani because less cal uh, less uh, little calcium or less calcium is entering the cell. The, the cell will reach to the positive the, uh, the positive membrane potential at a slower rate, okay? And that's what's indicated by, uh, uh, and this is why the slope is uh, decreased here. You see that this, uh, here it was uh, going rapidly to the th uh, threshold uh, at less time, but here it's taking more time uh, to reach to the threshold. This is the first effect of the parasympathetic nervous system. The second effect is that the parasympathetic system uh, uh, or the acetylcholine, uh, uh, it will result in the uh, uh, potassium channels being more uh, permeable. And we know that uh, inside of the cell, we have more of uh, potassium. And because the, the channels are more permeable, more, uh, more permeable so uh, more, uh, the calcium will move from the higher concentration, which is from inside of the cell, to the outside of the cell, which is a uh, lower concentration. And this will lead uh, to the inside of the cell being more negative. So, and that's why it will result in hyperpolarization. So it's going to become more negative going after the uh, negative 60, which is the maximum uh, uh, diastolic potential. Is that clear, uh, uh, Shahad? Okay. Yeah, and uh, as I said, the net effect. Uh, yeah, as I said, the net effect of uh, both of these uh, uh, mechanisms will result in uh, decreased uh, action potentials, as you can see here. You see, four, four normally uh, in a normal situation you have four or three and a half, uh, but uh, during parasympathetic simulation you will have less uh, of action potentials and less uh, heart rate. Uh, again, uh, cardiac output, as we said, is the stroke volume multiplied by the heart rate. Stroke volume, we said, is affected by three things, preload, afterload, and contractility. Uh, um, before we go going going uh, uh, into the heart rate, uh, let me ask you, if, if we increase the preload, will the uh, stroke volume increase or decrease? What do you think? Increase. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what about the afterload? If you increase the afterload, decrease stroke volume. Decrease. Who said increase? Okay, it will decrease. You're right. It will not increase. Uh, what about the contractility? Will it increase or decrease? If you have more contractility, will this result in more blood uh, getting increase, out increase. of increase? Yeah, exactly. Increase. Yeah, uh, the heart rate, as we said, as we 
we just saw that it, it's affected by two, the uh, sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, this is uh, what we saw earlier, the preload, it will shift the graph to the right. You know, you don't need to memorize uh, these. Uh, I'm not telling you don't memorize them. I need you to understand them so you can. Uh, uh, so when you have a question, you just think about it and then you, you, you can pick the right answer. Preload, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, this is the dashed line is the normal line. It's shifted to the right because you have what? Increased stroke volume. Uh, after load, because you have increased aortic pressure, the, 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 uh, the, um, the, uh, the graph is shifted upwards. And because it's difficult for the heart to, uh, to push blood out, uh, uh, it's difficult for the heart to push the blood out. So there will be less stroke volume. And that's, uh, that's the difference between the end diastolic and the uh, end systolic volume. Th that's why it's uh, in, uh, decreased and the uh, end sy uh, systolic volume will be increased because you have more blood in the heart after uh, contraction or after uh, sy uh, systole. Contractility, as we said, the, the graph will shift uh, to the left uh, and we will have increased uh, stroke volume. Is that clear? Okay. Uh, okay, ejection fraction, uh, uh, it's, it's a measurement for the heart uh, uh, efficiency. So it's, it's an index of, the, uh, uh, of, uh, of how well the heart is functioning, okay? Uh, and we use it to estimate the function of the left ventricle. Uh, so the, the, uh, the uh, formula that you use for uh, finding the ejection fraction is the stroke volume divided by the uh, end diastolic volume. And diastolic volume is this volume. Choke volume is end diastolic volume minus uh, end, uh, end systolic volume. Okay. And in a normal healthy person, uh, the uh, ejection fraction is between 0 0.55 to 0 0.65. So there's a range. Uh, okay. So assuming uh, this, this graph is uh, for a normal uh, uh, healthy person, uh, let's find the ejection fraction uh, uh, using this graph. Uh, so, uh, can someone help me? Well, uh, you guys, you guys want me to solve it? Okay, I'll solve it. Okay. Uh, as you said, uh, ejection fraction uh, uh, is uh, uh, stroke volume divided by end diastolic volume. So we need the end diastolic volume and the uh, uh, end systolic volume. So uh, assuming, as we said, assuming this is of a healthy uh, of a healthy individual, uh, the end diastolic volume is about uh, let's say one twenty, okay, and the uh, end systolic is fifty. So the systolic volume uh, is 120 minus 150, which is 70, divided by the end diastolic volume, which is 120, okay? And this uh, uh, gives us 58%, uh, which is normal. Okay, now that uh, I'm explaining the BV loop and uh, I explained the, uh, the changes to the BV loops, uh, there are some important uh, information that uh, you can get from a BV loop. First is the end systolic uh, volume. The end systolic volume, as we, you also, it's the A. It's A. Okay. Uh, what do you think of C? Uh, of D? Uh, is it end uh, systolic volume or not? Someone say. Doctor, no. Can you see the question again? Okay, so from uh, from the, the the graph, you can see that the end uh, the uh, end systolic volume is indicated uh, by a, right? So, do you think D is end diastolic volume too? 
yes. No, it, yes. no, it should be. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, end systolic volume. End systolic yeah, yeah. volume. Systolic, yeah. Both of them are end systolic volume. Uh, I think so, yeah, because it's the same volume in the end. Yeah, exactly. As Amr said, uh, iso uh, isovolumetric. Uh, this is this phase, phase four, is isovolumetric uh, relaxation. relaxation. Yes. So the volume doesn't change. So whether it's A or D, it's the same thing. It's end systolic volume. Okay. Uh, two is the end diastolic volume. It's B. Okay. Uh, do you think also C is end diastolic volume? Yes. Yes, it will follow the same rule. Yes, exactly. Show volume, uh, same thing. Uh, end diastolic volume minus the uh, end, uh, end systolic volume. Ejection fraction, as we saw, uh, once you know the end, uh, end diastolic volume and the uh, end systolic volume, you can just easily find the ejection fraction. The afterload is the pressure at uh, C. The blood pressure is the systolic uh, systolic uh, 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 pressure divided by diastolic pressure. Systolic pressure is the peak of phase three. Okay, so if we say the peak is one twenty, uh, diastolic is what do you think diastolic is? It's C. Okay, so uh, blood pressure is uh, systolic, which is the peak. Divide by diastolic. Uh, stroke work is just the area contained within the lobe. So if you uh, if you uh, if you calculate the area uh, inside uh, this lobe, uh, this is uh, uh, referred to as the stroke work. Doctor, just to confirm, so point mm. C gives us uh, the afterload, which is the force that the heart has to push against in order to eject. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and it also gives us uh, end uh, diastolic volume. Yes. And we use it to calculate blood pressure. It would indicate the diastolic pressure. Yes, yes. Okay. The systolic is the uh, the uh, peak of the uh, phase three. So it's not this, it's this, this the highest point here. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, do you have any questions? Sorry. Wait, let me read the chat. Okay, since you don't have a question for me, I have a, I have two questions for you. Okay. Are you ready to uh, to do the questions? Yes, yeah, Bismillah. Yeah. Okay. This is the first question. I got the, the the two questions that I got are from the doctor slides. I think he updated them. Uh, uh, so this is the first question. Uh, read it, and I'll give you a minute or two to to solve it. Does anyone know the answer? Anyone? 
or should I go and solve it? <clears throat> uh, you close. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, so let, let me. Uh, it's it's D. It's D. Uh, uh, let, uh, let me. Yeah. Let me solve it. Uh -huh. Right click. Okay. So for for us to uh, solve this question, uh, we have uh, okay. Let's read the question. Uh, a thirty five year old woman ejection fraction was. Give them Wait. Mm. Okay. Uh, ejection fraction was uh, zero point eight, and this uh, and systolic volume is 20, uh, 28 milliliter. Heart rate is one one forty three beats per minute. Which of the following is the uh, is the best approximation of the of her cardiac output? So you have so, so for you to answer this question. Uh, you're going to use three formulas. First of all, you have this formula. The cardiac output is equal to stroke volume times <clears throat> heart rate. Okay. You also have uh, and uh, sorry, uh, uh, ejection fraction is uh, stroke volume divided by and diastolic volume and also the shock volume equals n diastolic volume. I'm sorry. S V. Okay. So you have three uh, uh, formulas. The cardiac output equals the stroke volume multiplied by the heart rate. Ejection fraction equals the uh, stroke volume divided by n diastolic volume and the stroke volume itself uh, is equal uh, uh, equals to n diastolic volume minus n uh, uh, systolic volume. Okay. Now, what do you have? You have the ejection fraction. Ejection fraction uh, is 0. 0.8. Okay. Uh, and systolic volume is uh, 28. Heart rate is uh, okay. First, we have to use this formula to find what. To find the end diastolic volume. And after finding the end diastolic volume, we will find what? The stroke volume. After finding the stroke volume, we're going to uh, plug in the stroke volume uh, in this formula and multiply it by the heart rate to find the, um, the um, cardiac output. So uh, end diastolic volume is, is uh, 0. Uh, uh, just give me a second. Uh, top guys, give me one second so I can do it because it's somehow complicated and it needs any. Okay, okay, awesome. never mind. Uh, uh, okay, here, uh, uh, 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.8, assuming this is 0 0.8, uh, equals uh, stroke volume, which is the end V minus E S V divided by E D V. Okay, so, uh, we have the uh, uh we have the uh, the uh, end systolic volume, which is 28. Can I? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, okay, I I'm going to use the iPad so I can.
uh, sorry guys for all of this hustle. Uh, fast. Okay, so 28, okay. Uh, now, uh, uh, 28 is the end uh, uh, systolic volume. We're going to multiply the end diastolic volume here by the 0 0.8. So, so 0 0.8 multiplied by end diastolic volume equals, on the other side, we had the end diastolic volume minus end, uh, uh, not, it's 28, okay? Okay, so uh, I need uh, to have all the end diastolic volume in, in one side. So I'll move this to this side, okay? And this to the other side. So end diastolic volume, this one, minus 0 0.8 multiplied by end diastolic volume equals, this is move, it was negative 28, now it's positive 28, okay? Uh, now what's, what's common between uh, this, this part and this part? The end this diastolic volume. So I'll take it as a common part and diastolic volume, okay? And diastolic volume multiplied by what? should give us end diastolic volume. End diastolic volume multiplied by one would give us end diastolic volume minus. End diastolic volume multiplied by what would give us uh, negative 0 0.8 to be negative 0 0.8, okay? Which is equal to 28. Then the end diastolic volume. Now to remove this, you need to divide both sides by one minus 0 0.8, okay? So dividing the other side by, uh, if we divide this side by 1.0, uh, uh, one point, uh, if we divide this side by one minus 0 0.8, it's going to cancel out. So the other side will be 28 divided by one minus uh, or 0 0.2, which is, uh, One forty. Okay. Now we have the end diastolic volume. Okay, and so we can find the stroke uh, stroke volume. We said that uh, the uh, we can find the cardiac output at all. Cardiac output equal stroke volume, which is end diastolic volume. Yani one forty minus the end systo uh, end systolic volume twenty eight multiplied by the heart rate, which is 143, which sounds to about 16, okay? Just make sure. Uh, it's about 16, okay? Uh, is that clear? I know it's all messy, but you know, I hope the concept is clear. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, clean all this mess. Next question. Okay. Who wants to answer this question? First, read the question and answer it. Anyone wants to? All right. I guess I'll, uh, I'll read this and answer. Okay. So a 40 year old man is undertaking moderate uh, phasic exercise on a treadmill uh, as a consequence of elevated, elevated sympathetic tone 
which of the following proteins is most likely to be phosphorylated? Now, if you remember, uh, the, uh, the increase in uh, uh, sympathetic tone will result in which of the proteins being phosphorylated? Is it the plasma, uh, plasma uh, limel, calcium, uh, calcium ATPase, adenylate kinase, L-type calcium channels, uh, T-type calcium channels? Okay. It's C, right? Uh, uh, it's not B because it will activate adi uh, adi uh, adenyl uh, adenylate um, uh, cyclase, not kinase. Okay, that's why it's not B. Is that clear? Uh, who said B? Okay, yeah. So that's the difference. Uh, uh, what's activated is, uh, 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 is uh, the L-type calcium channels. It's not the T-type calcium channels. It's not the uh, plasma limel, uh, calcium uh, ATPase, and not the uh, adenylate uh, kinase. And it said uh, phosphorylated. Uh, so we had four, four things that were phosphorylated, the L-type calcium channels, the, uh, the um, ranadine channels, the phospholampin and the choponin I. These are these are the four um, things uh, or the channels or the proteins that are uh, phosphorylated as a result of the elevated sympathetic tone. Uh, okay, I think this concludes our uh, uh, session. Uh, do you guys have any questions or anything you want to say? Doctor, can you go back to the previous question? Sure. Uh, okay. yeah. yeah. So what we did was we uh, we divided by one minus EDV. Uh, get zero point two. We divided by one minus. Minus the end diastolic volume. No, we were trying uh, to find the end the end diastolic we, volume. Yeah, we were, we were trying the, to find the end diastolic the, volume. We divide by one minus um, uh, zero, zero point eight, eight, which is yeah. the e ejection fraction. Yeah. Okay, and and we can use that as a general formula to find. Uh, uh, yeah, if he's asking for. Volume. Uh, yeah, if he's asking for the same, if if, if he has given you the same uh, parameters, uh, the ejection the fraction, he gave the end systolic volume, heart rate is uh, uh, give the heart rate, then you can use it. Okay. Yeah, that was my question. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Any other questions, guys? Um, okay, so it seems like there's no questions. Uh, thank you guys for uh, attending. And uh, okay, okay, uh, uh, okay, I'll, I'll give you uh, five minutes. Uh, I'll be staying here in case. Anyone wants to ask? Thank you for this session. I'll stop the recording now. Yeah, yeah, sure.